be power hitters is a slice of life from every corner of the nation, every type of builder, developer, and manager. After all, it takes a full spectrum of talent and ability to create the housing needed for a nation as wide and diverse as ours. Greetings and welcome to another exciting NAHB Power Hitters. I'm your host, Linda Hoffman, coming to you from the smoky Sierra Nevadas, 6,500 feet above sea level with an air quality nearly as high at a hazy 225. I'm a big Johnny Mathis fan, but I've had enough smoke in my eyes for 30 lifetimes. Today, I am delighted to in introduce Ed Easley, president of LMC Development, a division of Lennar. LMC is the nation's fourth largest developer in a close run for total units delivered, with another 31,000 in the pipeline. In many aspects, Lennar is a turnkey organization, developing, building, acquiring, even managing product throughout the nation. Lennar was once predominantly in the urban core. Today they are everywhere, well anywhere that makes good business sense, from high rise, mid rise, garden and podium properties. Ed, thanks for joining us and welcome to the show. Thanks Linda, hook them horns. I'm in Austin, Texas and I'm a Longhorn. <laughs> Go Longhorns. Ed, you've worked with all the bigs, JPI, Crown Pacific, Discern, Windsor, racking up more than seven billion in deals over the course of your career. The industry has given us all a run for the money with one crisis after another, from pandemics to wildfires, to social unrest, to lumber and supply prices, and well, I'll just stop there. What have you experienced on your sites and how have you overcome the challenges, perhaps even creating resilience for the future? Well, I mean, these are these clearly are, the, are probably some of the most challenging times that uh, we've ever faced. I mean, with the social unrest, we've got fires, we've got hurricanes, we've got uh, COVID nineteen. So there's a there's a lot of things going on. But I think uh, I think one of the things that's uh, that's really begun to stand out is I think our home has taken on a whole different meaning now. Uh, you know, whether it's an apartment or whether it's a single family resident. I mean. Residents, it's really um, you know, it's it's not only shelter, but it's now your it's your gymnasium, it's your form of entertainment, um, it's a it's a safe and healthy place for most people. So I think uh, you know, Lennar and LMC, and I think everybody in our industry is really trying to figure out what is that going to mean going forward, and what sort of changes are we going to need to make to continue to you know serve the needs of our of our residents and and homeowners and everything. And I think that's a that's a that's a that's a big thing. It's a big challenge. I think it's going to take and uh, you know really force our industry to evolve in a, in a lot of different ways. Does the pandemic have a long term impact on projects coming into the pipeline? Uh, clearly, there has been there's been a pause in our business, um, and but I think people are beginning to beginning to take and 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 be forward looking and beginning to think about you know uh, when and how do we restart. Um, at LMC, we have uh, we're committed to starting four projects between now and the end of the year. One, uh, you know, one project in California, one in Denver, one in Atlanta, and one in Tennessee. And we're beginning to see the capital markets loosen up. Uh, people are interested in sticking their toe in the in the in the into the into the market again. And I think one of the opportunities is I think there's going to be a slowdown in uh, in the construct constructions cost escalation. Um, we, we think that's going to be slowing down here in the next next six months or so. It hasn't really slowed down. You haven't really been able to notice it just yet. But the other thing that's important is most of these projects aren't going to deliver until the last half of uh, 2022 or the first half of 2023. And so what that gives you the opportunity to be, uh, you know, uh, you know, to get to be one of the early uh, early projects in it when the economy is recovering, and that's typically when it's the strongest. So it gives you the opportunity to, you know, be one of the early movers in the, you know, when the markets recover. That's fantastic news. In fact, the best news I've heard yet. Much of Lenar's development is in house. What's the strategy behind bringing it under the roof line? And how does that pencil in a cyclical business? 
Well, okay, so we're a fully integrated company. We have uh, we have development, construction, property management, and asset management in-house in all 13 of our offices across the country. And I think what it does really is it gives you more control. Um, you know, you don't, you're not, you're, you're not depending on, you know, you're not depending on a third party property manager or a general contractor. Everything's in-house. And I think we work really well together. We, uh, we focus on collaborating. We focus on everybody having a seat at the table. And I think the end product really shows that. I mean, if you've got, if you've got everything in-house and you're not relying on third parties and you just control things, you know, you control everything that you're, you're dealing with and, uh, you're not, uh, you know, not exposed to, you know, third party, uh, you know, problems a general contractor might have or your third party property manager might have that have nothing to do with your business. So I think it's a, I think it's a great model. Well, you talked about um, your various properties. Lennar's target market was once luxury. Still the focus? You know, um, you know, you know, when we started this business, I mean, I think diversification was the key, you know, the key principle. I mean, we want to be diversified geographically. I mean, we're, we're in all the major markets across the country. And uh, the other thing is we wanted to be diversified on is our product type. So high rise, mid rise garden, you know, we have, uh, we, we've really been doing all of those. And I think that one of the, one of the benefits of that is that, you know, the, it's a it's a blended portfolio, and I mean the returns that you generate on a you know on a high rise are going to be less than the returns you might generate on a garden deal. So the so the blended returns I think are uh, you know are are really pretty you know pretty exciting. And as and when we're when we're out talking to investors and things, I think that's one of the things they look at when we talk about raising a a fund is kind of the the op opportunity to be geographically diversified, product diversified, and then the uh, you know, you get to get to have the blended returns, which are, you know, I think pretty strong. Today, what are Lennar's targets for development? Central business districts, major metros, suburbs, secondary metros, and what are the metrics that make, make it so? So, you know, I would say today we're more focused on suburban opportunities, uh, you know, rather than the urban core. Um, but we're still focused on the urban core too. We're, you know, gonna, we're going to take and maintain, uh, you know, our commitment to our strategy of being diversified. But I would say there's there's a bigger focus now on, on suburban opportunities because, frankly, I think that's where, you know, where some of the growth is is headed right now. I mean, I think there is to some extent a flight from the urban core because of COVID. Um, I do think that that will reverse itself. I think it's going to take a while. I think. Uh, you know, we've got to get COVID under control. We've got to get people back to work. And uh, and that, frankly, is going to take three to five years. So I don't think you'll see that uh, return to the urban core for, you know, for three to five years. The urban core is still doing very well. I mean, our, our collections and our occupancies have remained strong throughout this whole downturn. But, you know, clearly there's a lot more demand, I think, headed for the uh, headed for the suburbs. So so we're probably more focused on uh, suburban opportunities right now. But we but, gen but, you know, generally we've got things at every product type, uh, you know, urban, you know, mid rise, high rise and garden going everywhere. That's fantastic. Well, that's good to hear. So your urban core is still performing. Urban core is still performing. It still is performing. But Very clearly, good. like I say, people are people are, are moving to the suburbs. Mm -hmm. So overall, from an overarching perspective, in the 70s, when the boomers were coming of age, the US was producing um, over 700,000 apartments annually. Recently, the millennials and even larger generation has come to age to a far different housing supply, less than half the run rate of the 70s. What explains this and what can be done to boost the production of housing in America? You know, we have had a shortage of housing and shelter for a very long time. And uh, I think, you know, I, I think most of the home builders and the apartment developers, I think we're operating at a, you know, at a very high level right now. And, and but we're not delivering enough, enough product. And I, I don't see I don't see that coming to an end. I don't see us all of a sudden being able to produce the kind of uh, the kind of numbers that we're going to need to take and 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 solve the shortage, the housing shortage. So I don't I don't have a good answer for that. I think uh, you know there's there's capital restraints. There's uh, you know there's you know zoning and entitlement restraints. Uh, 
there's a lot of things that you're that you're up against, and uh, I just I don't I don't see an I don't see an end to that anytime soon. I think there's going to be, you know, we're going to be restricted, and uh, you know, and I I don't see just an awful lot of product coming online. And frankly, I mean, it's a it's probably a good thing for our business because it maintains very strong demand and pricing power. Right, right. Although it doesn't fare well for <laughs> for the population. The largest a lot of people that yeah yeah i just i i don't see any any way for for that to, for us to be able to meet that kind of demand i mean seven hundred thousand units is a is an awful lot of units and that it's you know 350 to 400 is about is a, is about what i think we're geared up to produce on an annual basis in a good in the good times we've both seen that market and uh it was lively <laughs> it, was. It, was, it was a good time <laughs> Right. One of the things I think that is going to really sort of uh, determine where we where we build is going to be, you know, where how are companies going to reopen? I mean, are companies going to go back to their offices or are we going to stay virtual? Um, uh, you know, what's going to happen there? Because, I mean, one of the things, we, you know, obviously for, you know, the fundamentals in our business, we focus on transit. We focus on, you know, uh, you know, the where, where are people employed, the employment centers. We focus on entertainment and uh, shopping. Uh, those are the kinds of things that we are always, uh, always looking to, you know, to try and, you know, try and make sure that they're, they're in our neighborhood. And I, and I just don't know, I don't know where that's going to go exactly anymore. I mean, what are the employment centers going to look like? I mean, it's a virtual thing here to stay. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's going to take and uh, it really change kind of, kind of where the growth happens, I think. Well, I would only ask you this because you have made some extremely prescient moves in your life and very timely with regard to market trends. What's your speculation on that? Will we go back to business as usual or are we changed forever? I think we've, I think we've changed forever. I, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, the, the ability to take and operate our businesses virtually um, is that that's been mind boggling to me. I never thought this could, could happen. I mean, I traveled, and up until March 2nd of this year, I traveled three days a week. Every, every, every week I was in the air, I was in a different city. I was, I was someplace and, uh, and that that's changed forever. I don't, I think I can be as effective, uh, you know, in the, you know, virtually, uh, that, you know, without doing all the travel, the travel is a lot of wear and tear. And frankly, I don't get as nearly as much accomplished because I'm not accomplishing anything when I'm in a restaurant or in a, in an airport or, you know, uh, you know, traveling, I'm just, there's just, you know, you can't get anything done. So, you know, the thing that's amazed me is how, you know, we and others have, are just operating at such a high level, you know, virtually that's, that's, that's not something I expected. And, uh, I think, you know, I think a lot of the innovation and the connectivity that, uh, that we have today, I think, you know, people are going to really focus on how do we make that even better. And uh, it's already pretty good, but I think there's got to be ways to make it better. And I, I think automation and innovation and in, in, in connectivity is going to be something that uh, we need to keep our eye on because I think that'll really help us, uh, you know, do it even better virtually. So I think, I think we're going to see I think we're going to see people travel less. I think the, you know, the, the ability to do business virtually, first of all, it's, uh, it's way, way cheaper, way, way more, you know, way, way easier, easier on people. And you just get so much more accomplished and everything. So I, I think that's going to be one of the biggest changes we see. And I think that does that translate into, you know, not as many people need office space. Uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, one of the things I think we've, uh, we've begun to notice, uh, you know, even though we've been operating very well virtually is that I think the, uh, you know, the one-on-one, -on -one, the in-person, you know, connectivity that, that, you know, I think there's, that's an important thing too. I think, she, you know, there's going to have to, it's, there's going to have to be a blend of that. So I think, you know, there's a lot of us that are anxious to get back to some of that, but not nearly at the level we were before, before COVID. I think the virtual, the virtual model is going to take and make some big changes in our lives. Wow. I have a uh, couple neighbors who are pilots for United, and they're hoping you're very wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I well, see. Um, yeah. 
I, it's gonna it's gonna be interesting, uh, but I, I mean, I think I think the virtual thing, uh, like I say, I think there's gonna be some innovation, um, you know, and automation, and, and and I think that's gonna make this even better. I mean, look at what we're doing today. I mean, this is pretty amazing, you know. I mean, I'm I'm on I'm on Zoom calls and, and Microsoft Teams calls all the time, and. Uh, and they're really affected. So anyway, I'm, I'm, I think, I think that's going to be a, that's going to be a change that's going to be here with us. And frankly, I'm going to not traveling this much has been a, a real benefit for me. Right. Well, productivity is the highest import, so you can't knock that. Exactly. Right. I'm, exactly. You don't, I don't think I ever really fully appreciated how much, uh, you know, how much time I spent in an airplane and in an airport and in, a, in an Uber and, and whatever, and just, you know the the lack of product productivity when you're doing that is uh, it's it's kind of it's it's really come to life for me now that I'm not doing it all the time. Oh, I'm sure it's it's really changed things a lot. The largest apartment developer in the country produced just over two percent of the new units in 2019. Hmm. Are there economies of scale that would support industry consolidation, or is development so dependent? on local knowledge that the little guys can hold their own? Well, the, you know, my observation there is, uh, you know, we're operating in all the major markets across the country. And one of our goals is to be one of the top five developers in each one of those markets. And I think we've achieved that across the, across the country. And the interesting thing is when you look at the markets, uh, look at the top five developers in each of these markets, it's really a blend of regional, national, and local developers. Um, so, I mean, that, and that's, I think that's true in almost every single market that we operate in and, and development is really a local business. So I think there is a, is, you know, I think there's always opportunity for a local developer to compete with a, you know, well-capitalized, uh, you know, corporate, uh, you know, institutional developer like our, like ourselves and even some of the larger regional developers. So I don't see, I don't see a lot of, I don't see that happening. I think, uh, it's like I say, a local business. I mean, you know, the capital is going to be attracted to, you know, to the to the real estate and uh, and to the you know, the sponsorship of the deal. And uh, there's a lot of really good local developers who are able to, you know, really assemble and craft a really really great projects because of their local knowledge. So, it's uh, I, I don't see that changing. Wow, that's that's fantastic. That's that fares well for local economies certainly. Ed, thank you for taking the time to join us and sharing your great insights. What a super show. This has been another great episode of NAHB Power Hitters. Ed Easley is one of the nation's greatest examples of nimbleness in times of tumult, as well as good times. It's this tenacity and strategic brilliance that make our country great and our housing providers amongst the most exceptional. I'm Linda Hoffman. See you on our next exciting episode of NAHB Power Hitters when we'll speak with Justin McDonald, President and CEO of McDonald Property Management. See you then.